All right, line Y1, learning task number two. We are just continuing on from where we were before. We're inside of the same one here. We're down at the very far end of this one where we are looking at the linear induction motor. And a linear induction motor is a three-phase motor that has had the stator that has been cut and then rolled out flat. So this stator over here, if this is what it was, I just sliced it and then they have gone and peeled this whole thing back out, which leaves us with this section over here, which is really gonna be the stator of our linear induction motor. We are going to go and have our poles going in. We've got ABC and ABC once again over here. Uh, for the actual poles that are going to be going into this one, we are also going to go and have underneath that something that is going to be similar to a rotor. We're going to have an iron back with an aluminum plate over top. The purpose of the aluminum plate over here is to go and set up current. That's why we need to have the aluminum plate. The purpose of the iron back over here is for magnetism. So we can go and set up magnetic fields inside of here. Let's go and take a look at how this thing goes and operates. And to do so, we're just going to go and use one of these that we have over here. We talked about this when we were talking about regular three-phase motors. We're going to use the same current drawing over here. Where we're going to say we have got current going in on A, and we have got half as much current coming out on B and C. We're going to go and use this point over here. So we're going to send current in on A, and then half as much that we are going to take out on B and C. Bulk current goes in on A, half as much that is going to come out on uh, B and C. And if I take a look at that, I see that I have got current going around in this direction through here. Then I'm going to go and follow that through to here where I see that that current is then going around in this direction. And then once it has gone through there, it is going to go and enter into each one of these. We've got the current that travels down, splits, enters into each of those. Some is going to go this way. Some is going to go this way. We'll trace this current around which is then going to go and end up here and we see it coming out and we'll take this current the c current we will trace that one around we will see it going in like that and then coming out <coughs> at this point we can use our left hand rules to go and establish our poles we see that this is going to go and be in north we see that this is going to go and be in north we see that this is going to be a north up here we see that this is going to be in north up here we see that this is going to be in north up here and we see that this is going to be in north over here therefore we know that corresponding poles have to be our south so we'll make a south a south and a south like that remember that we are going to go and have as these peek through we are going to go and change where our magnetic field is going to go and be and so it's going to go and rotate and instead of this thing rotating around inside of a circle and then restarting it is going to rotate along the bar we are going to go and have the magnetic field that's going to have be moved down the bar and then it's going to go and cycle back through and then it's going to go and skip and jump to the end and cycle back through is going to be the way that this is going to rotate as far as our magnetic lines of force are going to be uh, concerned, they are going to go from north over to south. So we are going to go and have magnetic lines of force that are going to go and leave here. They are, oops, sorry, I turned that one too soon. They're going to shoot straight across because they want to hit that magnetism of that iron back that we are going to have over there. So they're going to shoot straight across and then we are going to go and re-enter south. And then we are going to go and run through the stator like that. So we have got lines of force that are going to look like that this one over here is also going to go and have lines of force I'm going to hit the stator over here and then go to this one in up like that and then going back through the stator over there and then this one over here that is going to go and have lines of force hitting the iron coming back up and circling through lines of force lines of force here and here and so what we're going to get is every single place that we have get uh have got this piercing of the aluminum by these magnetic lines we have got everything that we need to go and set up values of voltage right eg is equal to blv we've got flux density that's the green arrows we've got length that's going to be the actual aluminum plate itself the aluminum plate does have length and width it's physical we're going to go and have velocity. Velocity is just going to be the way that that magnetic field is running to one end and then circling back around and then running back to the end and circling back around time and time again. What we'll have is we are going to go and have a very similar sort of effect to what we had on our rotor. Just with this 
uh, solid aluminum plate over here, we are going to go and have the plate itself that is not going to be separated, but it's going to act as if it were separate. If you can imagine, you can go and take a look at these over here as if they were conductors placed through each one of these. And you should see that if we have got conductors going through these, if we induce a current into those conductors, that we are then going to go and get some thrust that is going to go and happen off of these. This is better illustrated inside of this picture over here where they show physical motion of the stator compared to the travel of the stator field. For us to go and figure out what we have got for current, what we need to first do is we need to go and figure out what we can from our left-hand rule, which is going to be our generation. So to start, we're going to take a look at where do we have lines of force that are going down through, then they're going to go through the uh, steel on the back and they are going to go and enter back up and through like that. We'll just look at these two over here. The next thing that we're going to go and take a look at is which direction is my field moving? Well, it says that my field is moving this way, which would be the same thing as if my cur or my uh, conductors, my stator, was moving in the opposite direction, right? The field is going this way. It's the same as if this is going in the opposite direction. They give an analogy earlier on in the book about like, you know, you can be in a boat and if you push the dock, it is going to actually move the boat, not move you. You know, it's an opposite uh, reactions here. So we have got relative motion that is going to be in this direction over here. We're going to go and say the blue is going to be my direction that my conductors appear to be moving since the field is moving in the opposite direction. This is the field. That's the direction that the conductors appear to be moving. Use your left hand rule. First finger in the direction of your lines of flux. Your center finger folded in. Your thumb in the direction of thrust. Once you get those two lined up, if you line them up on the first one over here, you're going to go and see that your center finger is going to go and show you current going in like that. If you go to the next one over there, you're going to see that your center finger is going to show you current coming towards you. And that lines up with what they have inside of these over here. The next thing to do is figure out your direction of rotating magnetic fields. I'm going to erase these green. We're going to take a look at the magnetic field that's going to be rotating around those conductors that we have now got. Use your left hand rule, thumb in the direction of your current flow, and you should be able to go and see that this one is going to be circling around like that. This one over here is going to go and, oops, sorry, I put those arrows on backwards there. Uh, grab the wrong hand here to be quite honest. This one over here is going to be circulating around like that. This one over here is going to be circulating around like that. Okay. The last thing that we're going to do is we're going to go and take a look at our lines of flux. We're going to run them into here. It's same as what we talked about before. It's like dealing with heavy equipment that's rotating. As soon as I fire this line of flux towards here, it can't cross. So it's going to get ripped around in the direction of that field. And then it's going to go and straighten back out. So we're going to have that one going in like that. That line of flux travels through here. It then comes up on this side. As it comes up on this side, it's going to get caught by that circulating uh, magnetic field over there. And it's going to get ripped around in this direction over here as it gets sent back up into the stator. And what you see off of this is that you are going to go and have magnetic lines. Now those magnetic lines are stretched out and they're trying to go and push this out. But the problem is that this part over here is fixed down. So if it's trying to push that out, what's actually going to happen, imagine yourself in like a rolling office chair or something like that, try to push away from the desk. If you're in a rolling office chair and you try to push away from the desk, it's going to be you that actually moves, not the desk. And the same thing happens with this because it is trying to push this lower uh, rotor, the, the flat rotor away. What it actually ends up doing is it is going to go and move the actual physical stator in that direction as it levels out. These are going to go and uh, give us linear motion that's going to be limited. Obviously, this thing is not going to be unlimited where we can kind of keep going and going and going forever. There is, you know, a really beautiful benefit to the way that it's built. I mean, if I take a look at this, I see that as long as I have got motors on this thing, I'm going to be able to just use magnetic fields to push myself off of anything that's got an aluminum plate and an iron back. We'll use these sometimes for linear motion inside of um, 
Oh, inside of things like uh, trains can go and use them, maglev trains can go and use them to go and push themselves along, etc. But we don't use a ton of these inside of industry just because if we want linear motion, usually it's much easier accomplished for us to go and have rotary motion where we are going to go and have a motor and then we're going to go and stick like a screw shaft onto that thing or something like that. And then we just run a pillow block along, it, which is going to be able to give us uh, linear movement but we're just converting it from the rotary itself. Speed as well off of these is going to go and be a different formula. Speed is going to be uh, determined once again as synchronous speed and then it's going to have to be slipping. It's going to operate a little bit less than the synchronous speed but the synchronous speed is going to be 2 times my pull pitch times my frequency. Pull pitch is just going to be measured in meters and frequency is going to be measured in hertz. And what it's going to give me is a meters per second off of these. Don't stress out too much about these. Uh, they're not a common, common utilized component for us inside of our field. They're a little bit more of a novelty or an oddity that we're going to have, but they are a part of your curriculum that you're supposed to learn. And it is really just nothing more than a cut and unrolled motor where the rotor is flattened down, fastened down, and then the stator itself is going to go and ride across it. If you go through their uses, um, primarily, it's almost always going to go and be for transportation, where we are going to go and use them on maglev or magnetic lev levitation types of trains. There has been some limited use of linear induction motors for vertical lifting, where you have got a power uh, pack that is then going to go and lift as long as we've got a vertical aluminum with a uh, iron back, we can go and you know lift up along the side of that. But once again, this is going to be something that's going to be entirely dependent upon power. So if you do have a power failure, you're then going to go and you know uh, lose whatever that lift is going to go and be. Uh, and the last part that has been used and that I think is probably the most interesting use of these ones is they can be used to go and pump molten aluminum itself uh, to move the aluminum itself along because the aluminum does not want to go and get attracted it's non-magnetic but it would get repelled out of there and so if you've got a fixed if this thing gets fixed down so we'll say it's been fastened to the ceiling that this over here is a metal trough a steel trough that's fastened if you're melting and if you're processing aluminum what you can then do with that uh, process is you can then use these magnetic fields you can induce them in the molten aluminum and then you're able to, by pushing your field along, also push the molten aluminum along inside of there. Kind of a cool application. The rest of them, um, yeah, <laughs> chances of running into these things, pretty slim to nothing outside of maybe a little bit of work inside of like elevators and doors, but pretty, pretty slim chances.